My name is Dan Nadekar, I'm the clinical lead for critical care at Bolton. I'm just going to talk you through a process that we did, we started about a year ago um, because we've, we had a problem with infection control on intensive care uh, and that's a problem for all intensive cares. Um, uh, our patients are vulnerable to infections, they've often got infections and the possibility of transmission of an infection from one patient to another uh, is always there. And the other problem that you've got on in intensive care is a very complex environment. You've got lots of different people trying to do different things often at the same time. There's lots of coming and going. There's lots of contact between uh, the patient and other things, monitors, ventilators, um, syringe pumps, uh, the, the notes, the bedding, the tubes. Um, so the opportunity to make infection control transgressions is all the time, it's all there. Uh, and we thought that one of the problems with tackling this is the psychology of how you try and get people to not transmit infection. And sometimes you have a setup where it's almost like you've got an external policeman or school prefect standing there watching your behaviour. So that would sometimes be an infection control nurse or the senior sister, and they would be policing other people's behaviour and telling them to wash their hands and informing them and telling them off. And it doesn't really work because you can't do it all the time and it sets up the wrong psychology. So what we wanted to try and improve was self-policing, people changing their own behaviour and making decisions uh, about what's the right thing to do at the right time. The problem here is that you've got a tension between infection control and all the other things that you're doing for the patient. And those two things are in tension and they often conflict with each other. The best way to have to cut down infection control is not touch the patient at all. Of course, intensive care nurses and doctors can't not touch the patients. The patients often need to be attended to in an emergency. Uh, they often need physical contact for various reasons. Um, so you have to be making decisions in real time about what to do to manage the looking after of the patient and the problems with infection control. So we set up a little process whereby one person would stand on intensive care and just watch. Um, for about half an hour. We thought half an hour was the right balance between getting enough data and it being achievable in terms of um, concentration span. So uh, the person stands on intensive care and they just watch. And then what they're looking for, we coined a, a term called the major infection control transgression. So we called it the MICT audit, which we just made that up ourselves. Um, and what we're looking for is if you touch a patient and then you touch something else connected to another patient and that can be the patient themselves or the bed or the monitor or anything if you make some sort of transmission without doing something else in between and that can be gel it can be putting new gloves on it can be washing your hands if it's a stethoscope it's wiping the stethoscope whatever is suitable to, to that trend to stopping that transmission or making a break in the chain of transmission uh, if you don't do that it's a transgression and it gets ticked down and to stop it being confrontational, we started uh, at the beginning of the, the rule was you wouldn't tell the person. So you would observe it had happened, you would note it down, but you weren't allowed to tell them. Uh, and we would just measure how many would happen and we would, whatever the number was, timed it up by two and that was our rate per hour of uh, transgressions. And we asked a few people to begin with, what would, you, what would you guess would be our hourly rate of hygiene transgressions? And lots of people came up with low numbers like one or two or three. And the first time we did it, it was about 20, which people were shocked at that 20 times every hour we were making hygiene transgressions. Uh, that was a bit false because we deliberately chose a busy time, so timesing that up over 24 hours is a bit false, but it was giving an impression of the problem that we had. Uh, so we carried on doing it, and it was very important to have different uh, members of staff doing the audit each time, uh, and people from um, different disciplines doing it. Uh, and the rate went up and down a bit, um, and often people were interpreting a transgression as being one thing, but other people just didn't think it was a transgression. So there was a bit of an argument went on about, if I pull back the curtains, do I then have to wash my hands? Uh, and the answer to that was, if you think so, really, for me, it was, you decide in your own mind, if you think you need to wash your hands, then wash your hands. What I wanted to get away from, I didn't want a very long, complicated list of rules about this is what you must do. What I want you to do is decide for yourself when you need to do something, and if you do, then do it. And it carried on, it's been going on about a year, and we've got pretty good data now showing that the rates of transgressions has come down a lot. Uh, and the past uh, few audits, it's been around about between two and four, and that's probably the lowest it will go, because 
of the environment where you're looking after patients, you have to touch them to look after them, and sometimes you don't do anything. And that's fine, because I think we've probably got it as low as we can go, um, along with the problem of having to look after the patients. Um, and for me, the audit is not um, putting it up on a board and showing people. The audit, the change comes from when people are nominated to be the watcher. When you're stood there watching other people struggle with, do I wash my hands now or not, or I've just touched the patient, what do I have to do? The next day, your behaviour changes and you start policing yourself in a more effective way. Um, and the other thing that happened was that after a few weeks, people didn't want the anonymity. They wanted to know. So people said, if I've done a transgression, I just want you to tell me. So just tell me that I forgot and that's fine. So the confrontation of being told diminished slightly as well. Uh, and now it's been running for quite a long time. It's fairly well embedded as a standard practice. Uh, it, in terms of um, applicability to other areas, it may well not be applicable to, to some other areas that don't face the same problems. But for me, the principle is very important. It's about if you watch people doing your job and with a specific aim in mind, you come up with ways of how you can do your job better. And I think you could probably apply that to almost every area. Um, this isn't a new idea, there's lots of people have done this similar idea, but just for a fairly short period of watching other people do your job makes you think about how your job can be better. And it's about devolving power, autonomy and responsibility and creativity down to the people who are doing the job and not providing rules for them, allowing them to come up with their own solution and their own rule about what's the right thing to do at the right moment.